Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. We are going to look at the visit of the Magi. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold and of, its, of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of God for the people of God. We say thanks be to God. Please pray with me, Lord, in this familiar story. We see many things. Most of all, we see the joy that they experienced in finding what they were looking for. Lord, may we find in this word today exactly what we are looking for, and may you add a, a blessing to this word today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. We heard a reading earlier from Philippians. Uh, from Carol and George in the Advent reading this morning, the candle reading. That's one of my favorite scriptures. I, I'm not a good memorizer of scripture, but that is one that I memorize and that I pray uh, constantly, especially about the anxious thing. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of Christ, which passes understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but as we get older, sometimes we have a little trouble sleeping at night. We wake up and our brains just go, wow, like a little neon light comes on, and right? And everything's spinning through there. And the other night, I literally must have prayed those words a hundred times as I just lay there in bed. And anxiety tried to get me all worked up and I just kept saying be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and petition thanksgiving present your request to God today this third Sunday in Advent we light the candle of joy and we celebrate the good news of Advent that God is coming Isaiah spoke about what Matthew talks about in this passage today Isaiah 35 talks about being filled with joy, joy so amazing that, that springs bubble up in dry deserts and sorrowful, longing sighs become songs of rejoicing. I am a big proponent of joy and of choosing joy, as you can see, not just by the shirt. I have a lot of um, things that remind me to choose joy. Ever since that's been my motto when I was in youth ministry back in the early 2000s, um, when, when you, people know that that's your motto, they, they give you things that say joy, like Patty gave me that little uh, uh, ornament. It's on my tree over there right now. Um, I have it everywhere. What is joy? Joy, Webster's Dictionary defines it as a feeling or a state of great delight or happiness as caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Another definition says feelings of 
great happiness or pleasure, especially of an elevated or spiritual kind. But you know, I've, I've been reminded over and over again that joy is not happiness. That joy comes from somewhere completely different than happiness comes from. That, that joy is something to be chosen, it's something to be hung on to. In Matthew's Gospel, we have the story of the wise men, the Magi, seeking this baby and experiencing great joy when they find him. And we remember that, first of all, it starts with seeking. These Magi were not Jews. They, they, they did not um, study the Jewish scriptures except when they found out about this king and this Messiah that was going to change the world. They were Gentiles, and they were seeking an answer to something that they knew was coming. Signs were pointing them that something was about to happen, and they went to Jerusalem first, because that, of course, is the center of everything, and that would be where something important, like the birth of a king, would, would happen, they assumed. And there was a king there. There was King Herod, King Herod the Great. I have a feeling that King Herod gave himself that name. I don't know. He was appointed by Rome to be the king of the Jews. He was not a Jew himself. Now, he did some great things. He built, he built the temple that was supposed to be the most magnificent thing people had seen. But he wasn't really concerned with the Jewish people, and he wasn't concerned with the Jewish law and traditions. He was really not a very nice guy. Herod was a all about Herod. Herod. Herod was about power and about getting power and about keeping power. Towards the end of his life, Herod became so um, obsessed with power that he had his own wife and two of his sons killed for disagreeing with him. He was searching for this child because he'd heard that he was going to be a king. Well, that just didn't go over well with Herod because Herod was the king. He wasn't the king, but he was the king. And, and this new ruler that was coming that was going to rule all of the Jewish people was a concern to him. And it says that he was greatly troubled in all Jerusalem with him. When Herod was troubled, everybody was troubled. You know that kind of person, right? You know, I've talked before about joy vampires. <laughs> Herod was about the biggest joy vampire there could be. You know joy vampires? They're those people that just suck the joy out of a room, suck the joy out of your life, right? You know them. You have them in your life. we got to stay away from them. we gotta, we got to have the, the cross and the garlic or whatever. Whatever we need to stay away from them because they will suck your joy. And Herod was more than that. He was not just a joy vampire. He was a crazed and violent person. And he had no intention of worshiping Jesus when he found him. He was going to kill him, as we find out later, exactly what he did. He, he sent his henchmen to go and kill all the babies to make sure they got that child. When the wise men eventually followed the star to Bethlehem, it's hard to imagine the star stopping at a specific house where Jesus was. It's likely that it was in that area, and they had to make some inquiries as to where the child was. I wonder if they maybe talked to some of the shepherds. You know, we remember from a couple weeks ago the story of the, the angel appearing in the sky and the heavenly host telling the shepherds what was going on. I'm sure the, the shepherds we read in Scripture went back and talked and told of this thing. So, so maybe the word was already spreading when these magi showed up. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, they said. So the whole area must have been a buzz. When they got there, it says they, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. That's, that's about the best way to describe it in the Greek. They rejoiced with great, exceeding joy. That's just, that's more than just being happy. I want to tell you that being, hanging on to your joy and choosing joy Sometimes looks a little like, um, Zach, there's a picture uh, up there behind. Actually, what happened to Sermon's life? 
It wasn't. Okay, well, then, is there a picture? Of the little kids? No. Ah, you're kidding. That's why I know it's me. Can you, there's a, there's a picture in the pictures of three little kids. There's a picture that, that just perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about. It's this, it's a, a photography uh, uh, studio was taking a Christmas picture of three little, I guess they were siblings, and they each had uh, the letters of the word joy, right? You've probably seen it, it's been all over Facebook. They're each, they're each holding a letter uh, spelling out joy, but they are just crying. Each one of them, you can tell, is in such distress. They are just howling. And they're holding on to those letters of joy. And I'm like, that is the picture. Because this week, I've got to tell you, I have felt like I was hanging on to my joy by my fingernails. Between my health concerns and, and then my brother and getting a chance to go down and see him and all, the, all that, that that brings. There was an unexpected conflict that arose this week out of somewhere. I just felt like those kids just hanging on to that joy. It's not easy, and it's not being happy, and it's not walking around with a grin on your face that makes you look like you're either on some sort of medication or you're insane. Joy is deeper than that. Patty's got one of those smiles that makes me. Joy is deeper than that, and we have to hang on to it. We have to understand that the joy of the Lord comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ and that that is the joy that's, that's buried down deep in there sometimes. And it, 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 it takes everything we have sometimes to, to hang on to it and pull it out. But it's there. It's there when we're believers and we know who God is and we know his promises. It's there. When we worship Jesus like the Magi did, when we... When we bow down, when we, in other words, when we're humble, when we humbly admit that we don't make all the rules and we don't have all the power and we don't have control over illnesses and, and relationships sometimes and finances, when we admit that, even after we kick and scream a little bit and, and kick our feet, when we really admit that and know that deep down, that is when we can have joy. I thank God for joy. There they are. <laughs> now, I don't think you'll ever forget that picture of joy. That's how I felt this week. <laughs> but I'm hanging on to it. They're hanging on to those, those letters. That's what we have to do. We have to hang on with everything we've got. The gifts that the Magi brought were for a king. The gold was for his royalty. The frankincense was a gift that, that spoke about his divinity. You can turn it. Yeah, that's better. The, the myrrh was a spice for his burial. These were appropriate gifts for one who was a king, one who was going to be the suffering servant of God. They really weren't very practical gifts to bring a child. You know, I've heard it said that if the Magi were women, they would have brought things like, you know, soup for the mother and diapers and some, some blankets, you know. But this was the gifts to show who Jesus was. It wasn't practical, maybe, in one sense, but, you know, neither is worship. Neither is tithing. You know, neither is giving our, our, our tithes to God's kingdom. It doesn't make sense. It's not practical. But this is what we do when we worship from deep inside that place of exceeding great joy. It's the fourth gift that the Magi gave that is important. It is that gift of worship, that gift of kneeling, that gift of humbling ourselves. And as we go to the table this morning, again, we're going to have communion, and we take it by intention. We take a piece of bread and, and <coughs> dip it in the cup. We remember 
that Christ came not just to be born for us, but that he came to die for us. That because of our sinful and proud and rebellious way, this was the way that would make a way for us where there was no way. This child that grew into a man that, that taught love and mercy, that hung out with people that everybody else said didn't deserve God's grace. This man would, would sit at the table with his friends as he looked ahead moments to his own death on a cross. When he sat with his friends, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them and he said, take this and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he blessed it and he gave it to them. And he said, take this and drink, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you. The blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we remember today. That you did not just come to be born for us, but you came to suffer and die for us because of your great and amazing and impractical, radical love. So pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ for this world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray.